Hello, I'm Lynn McLean from emraustralia.com.au and today I'm talking to Vic Leach, who's a physicist who's worked in the area of radiation and health for 50 years, specialising in the area of nuclear radiation. He's worked both for the public and private sectors and for federal and state bodies. He was also a radiation advisor at the Queensland University of Technology and then the University of Queensland. Vic has been on the organising committee of the Australian Radiation Protection Society and is a founding member of the Oceania Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association, also known as AWSA. Today, Vic joins me from Queensland to talk about the effects of 5G radiation, a topic that's relevant to us all. Welcome, Vic, and thanks very much for talking with me today. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Thanks for inviting me to, uh, to talk. Um, I was at the um, uh, last week we were at the Australian Radiation Protection Society conference in Canberra and um, also has actually translated a, a book uh, which um, is is really a very interesting book because it's in another language and um, and the person who wrote this book is in his country is a, a titan in this area He's uh, not only a, um, a professional uh, biophysicist and physicist, but he's also a doctor. He's a medical doctor as well, and has, be, has been responsible really for uh, making sure that the Russian standard was uh, set at 100 times lower than the, the Australian standard. So why did they do that is the question. And um, I, what, what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, the book that we've just translated. It almost took us two years. So the first thing I'll do is to um, share my screen and uh, go through that presentation. It should take around uh, 20 minutes. Um, OK. Thanks, Vic. We're looking forward to seeing it. Good. Uh, OK. Um, uh, Yuri Gagorovich, um, he, um, we started this process almost two years ago. And uh, he, um, as I said, he uh, was a press, press professor, he was an academic, but he was also head of the, uh, uh, the Bureau of Nuclear Reg Re Regulatory Radiation. So he, he, he also had a, a finger in setting the actual standards. Uh, he, he wrote this book, it's called A Mouthful, uh, 5G Cellular Standard Total Radiobiological Assessment of the Dangers of Planetary Electromagnetic Radiation <laughs> Exposure to Population. It's quite a mouthful. But this book actually contained over 40, or 40 years or 50 years of his experience mm -hmm. in this area. Unfortunately, last April, April he passed away, and uh, but luckily we actually had a great majority of this book translated uh he 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 um he he supervised over 95 uh, phd students uh in in his in his academic career but um as i said he wasn't just um he actually um got involved in experiments but he also uh, was uh, at the forefront of setting the standard in that country. So this was the book we started to translate at, at great cost. Um, we had to uh, employ a, um, a professional writer to help us. I had a uh, Russian friend here in Australia who assisted me in the translation and we translated it paragraph by paragraph. And uh, he would give a tick in the box when we got it right. And uh, I get a cross in the box when we got it wrong. So there was a lot of work, a lot of work involved in, in producing this book. And as I said, it almost, um, well, it's two years to this point in time. Um, that sounds like an excellent resource, Vic. And is the book finished now? Uh, yes, it is. We, we've got a, a draft version that we're going to make available uh, very shortly. I will uh, put out a, a short, awesome newsletter, mm -hmm. and uh, we will um, uh, we, we will make the, a PDF version available. Uh, Yuri, as you can see, he was a most esteemed colleague. He was very revered in his country. His qualifications were in biophysics and medicine. Uh, Yuri, when I when I started talking to Yuri, 
I realised that as a radiation health physicist, I was on the same page as he was. Uh, we talked about the precautionary approach. Uh, we, 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 we were very, um, uh, how can I say, we, he, he was a, a very, he, he, he had great humanity. Uh, he was very concerned about children uh, and the exposure of children over a long period of time. He was very, very worried that children were being exposed um, and unnecessarily. And um, he, were, as I said, he was uh, head of the uh, state. He was the head of the uh, state research center uh, for medical bio, the biophysical center for a number, a number of years. Uh, the center is a powerful research and clinical cluster, and is a flagship institution of public health uh, for the Russian Federation in both uh, biophysics, radiation, and nu nuclear safety. Uh, the center for clinical innovation. It had uh, this centre that that uh, I'm talking about. We have no equivalent of that in Australia. We have our uh, university hospitals, but this centre was devoted to radiation, radiation uh, clinical uh, clinical work, as well as it had a public health authority attached to it. Uh, this is the name of the centre. It's the Bernesium. Uh, center. It's uh, as as you can see, it's a very. It uses uh, 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 non-ionizing radiation. It uses that for for both um, uh, clinical uh, therapy, but it also uses it. It looks at the detriment and the downside associated with using this radiation. The book we translated uh, had the title. We changed the title to frequency used in telecommunications. Uh, and the reason we did that is because it wasn't just about 5G. It was uh, the millimeter waves. It was about uh, the other frequencies as well. As well. So um, it, they have, uh, the Russians uh, back in the 1960s, they were using millimeter waves for both uh, therapy and they had a lot of experience with radar operators and that. Uh, the adverse effect on radar, radar operators. He, once you go to these very high, uh, short wavelength, uh, high, very high frequencies, uh, short wavelengths, the most of the attenuation is in the skin and the eyes. Uh, the sclera of the eyes, which is the white of the eyes, there's almost no research in this area. Absolutely just a few smatterings of animal studies. And skin, there's very limited research. Now the ICNIRP approach or the APANZA approach to setting guidelines completely ignores all the biological effects of uh, the ionizing, non-ionizing radiation, these wireless radiation, uh, which is being absorbed in the skin. Skin is treated just like an inert substrate with no biological function. Right. It's treated as an overcoat, uh, just as an overcoat. Uh, the only criterion setting limits uh, is for heating and pain. So and the, uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, ahead. sorry, Vic. And just to, um, if I could interrupt for a sec. So when we're talking about ICNIRT, we're talking about the International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. And that's uh, an international body that has set itself up as, uh, as the, the authority for putting out guidelines on standards and a lot of countries adopt those guidelines and turn them into standards and Australia has done that too. So the, their guidelines you're saying aren't really adequate for protecting against the high frequencies. Am I understanding yep. correctly? Yes, that, that's correct. The, um, the, the guidelines are based on heating. That's the, the all these uh, effects that we see at much, much lower levels than heating are basically ignored. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a minute, but they ICNIRP guidelines are the ones that uh, are being um, adopted by Australia, America, uh, a lot of the European countries, except Russia. Russia said no, the, these guidelines are not protective of uh, members of the public who are actually being exposed 24 seven at much, much lower levels. These, are, these, these, these guidelines are for heating. These guidelines might be fine for, a, for occupational health, 
but they are certainly not fine for long-term exposure to populations who have a great variety of different health conditions. Uh, they're not a homogeneous population. So these guidelines don't take into effect the biological effect on people. Uh, they only take into account the biological effect which results from heating. Um, they, they, as I say, it ignores the biological role of the skin. And uh, Darius Levinsky, who's a researcher in this area, has been researching this area for the last 40 years. Uh, he wrote a paper in 2020 and said, look, I can only find about 80 papers but the, 80, uh, the, the, the problem with those 80 papers is that the signals aren't the same as what is used in wireless communication, and I'll get to that shortly. Um, our organisation, the Oceana Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association, um, we're a not-for-profit organisation. We have four members, and, but we also have a lot of supporters, people who are associate members who, who help us. Um, we advocate for change and make submissions to government. We're not an activist group. We're an advocacy group. We're wanting uh, people to listen to what we have to say and produce uh, uh, solid uh, scientific evidence to support our views. Uh, we, uh, as uh, part of our, um, part of our uh, major effort was to put together a, an online database there are other online databases, but this particular database has gone to a lot of trouble. We've gone to a lot of trouble to categorise the papers into effect and no effect papers, and uh, we've actually gone a lot deeper than that. So that's our flag that's uh, basically our contribution, which has been a very costly exercise and it's taken a lot of work. When you look at the balance of evidence. And I'm talking about these non-thermal effects. I'm not talking about the ICNRP or Panzer standard, which are based on thermal effects. I'm looking at all the papers that are much, much, much lower than that. Are we seeing a biological effect? Uh, and the answer you can see from this pie chart, I'll just explain this a little bit. Over two thirds of the papers, these are the experimental papers, show biological effect. And when you look at the, there's a number of in vitro papers, these are cell studies. This is where they, they look down, at, they irradiate the sample, the cells, and they look down a microscope and they look for changes. So there's cell, quite a lot of cell studies. There's also what we call in vivo studies. Now these are animal studies where the whole animal, the rats and mice, but there are some primates in there that also have got irradiated. And they look for changes in, in, uh, in the cells and the, the bloods of these animals. They look for biological changes. And then we've got what we call epidemiological studies, which you've heard a lot about uh, with COVID-19, where, where you look at population groups and you look at changes in those population groups. And uh, so they're um, statistical, basically statistical studies uh, where they're showing a show association between exposure and effect in humans. And then we've got a lot of what we call non-experimental scientific studies. These are review studies. There's lots and lots of review studies. And these review studies, you have to be very careful looking at review studies because you've got to look at who's funding the research. Uh, if, government is, if government and institutions are funding the review studies, the, uh, the outcomes are usually quite different to that if the industries uh, funding the review studies, their outcomes are very, very different. Um, there's also a number of papers that show there's possible therapeutic effects, that there's a positive, uh, might be a positive effect in irradiating uh, the animal or the cells. They're seeing adaptive response. They've, they're seeing changes that might have some therapeutic output like bone healing or whatever. And then there's these silly studies which are called provo provocation studies, where they put a person in a room, they either uh, put a, a, an electroencephalogram on a, uh, a reading, a read his brainwave patterns, or they don't, and they put a person in a room and they turn on the antenna and they say, do you feel it? Now, these sorts of studies are, are a bit silly because a biological systems aren't linear. What I mean by that is that uh, with, uh, for example, UV radiation, uh, you might go out in the sun today, but it's not till tomorrow 
that you you uh, have su you suddenly discover that you've got sunburn. So biological systems aren't linear, and so I have a lot of trouble with these human provocation studies. But these are the studies that we've been carrying out in Australia. Um, that's why we've been spending most of our money, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further on. ICNRP guidelines ignore non-thermal effects. They say, oh yeah, the these biological effects, we can see the papers, but they don't have any healthy outcome. Well, they don't know that, but that's a very bold statement. And um, as you'll see, it's um, it's really, <laughs> you have to be out there to be able to say a statement like that. I, I don't think uh, a person like Yuri would, would ever say a statement like that. When you look at the number of experimental papers, and as I said, in our database, we categorise the biological effects into different categories. And I just want you to look at this one, DNA damage. Um, there are 228 papers on DNA damage. Now, those papers show DNA damage, uh, either cellular studies or their animal studies. And this is very concerning because DNA damage is a precursor to cancer. There's another group here, oxidative stress, um, production of free radicals, a lot of papers in that area as well. And we also hear from a lot of people uh, that they've got headaches and migraines when they get close, when they're using a mobile phone for many hours a day, they get a hot ear, they get headaches, they don't feel well, they feel nauseous. And uh, there's also a lot of people at much, much lower levels that um, say, look, I, I go near the Wi-Fi ra router and I just don't feel well. Um, and tumour promotion, and this is an interesting one, where um, a number of scientists have said, look, we don't know if it's a tumour initiator, but it, it definitely is a tumour promoter. And so there's quite a few papers in that area. Um, skin, as I said, skin is a very important organ. The uh, PANZER or ICNRP guidelines completely ignore the biological effects of the skin. Uh, it's our largest organ. It interfaces with the immune system. It's rich in nerves and very sensitive. It connects to the brain and central nervous system. Um, it, its receptors carry um, innervation. It's central. It's part of our autonomic nervous system. It regulates uh, regulates immunity and wound healing. Its surface is full of microbes, friendly microbes that we live on our skin, and. Uh, and it's also part of our waste removal system. Uh, if you're poisoned, uh, the you can uh, discharge toxins through the body, through the skin. It protects us against mechanical and chemical factors and performs endocrine, endocrine function. They produce vitamin D for our health. This is skin is not an overcoat. Skin is not an inert substrate. Straight. How you can set a standard on the basis of ignoring all these biological effects and health effects is beyond me. The sclera or the whites of the eye, it's very comp the eyes are a very complicated uh, piece of uh, an organ. Very, It's very complex, I'm not gonna go into it, but um, what, what, what we do know is that uh, radar operators in the 1950s, and most of those um, were, um, were Russian radar operators, showed um, that they were getting cataracts. Um, unfortunately, um, over half a century later, there are still only isolated studies on the effect of millimetre waves. These are the 5G waves that we're going to be using for communication on the sclera of the whites of the eye. Uh, moreover, studies were performed with short-term high energy um, uh, beams. That is uh, the thermal, they were looking at the thermal effects. They weren't looking at the non-thermal effects. Those effects much, much lower. Um, when, you, when, you look at, um, the, uh, when you look at what research we do have in this area, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, very thin, uh, a few rabbit experiments uh, and uh, some non, non-human primate experiments. Uh, so very, very few uh, experiments, almost none. I just want to say something about simulated versus real signals. We hear in the media all the time, oh, you know, mobile phones, it, uh, it, this 5G frequencies, millimetre wave frequencies we're going to be using, it's just like 
going in scanning in a um just being scanned in a in 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 an airport scanner you know it's not it forget that the signals are completely different you can't compare okay it might be a millimeter waves but the signal signals are very different when you when you isolate the research between real the experimenters use both real and simulated signals when you look at real signals he, up here you can see the real signals you can see the intensity varies quite dramatically it also is pulsed it's low frequency pulsed so besides the data being carried on the on the millimeter waves the data is carried uh, the carrier wave is is gigahertz besides the carrier wave we've also got this low frequency pulsing so when you look at the experiments between real mo with use real mobile phones in the cages of the animals or they use simulated mobile phone signals you see a very different outcome you, the number of effect papers is 128 to 18 there's a clear clear difference between effect and no effect there you see a much more uh, much it's much clearer whereas when you go to simulated signals uh, the the actual difference between effect and no effect is not so clear so real mobile phone signals are very different and this is an experiment that um, a group of scientists and engineers in uh, Montreal in Canada decided they wanted to, wanted to try and make uh, the uh, visible, the invisible, visible. So the, what they did, what they did as an experiment, to uh, to look at Wi-Fi frequencies and show them as a colour, something we could actually see. And this is this is what it looked like. Um, I'm actually going to produce a paper for this talk, uh, and it will be published in our journal, the Australasian. Uh, radiation protection journal and uh, the full paper and, you, and there's a link in there so you'll be able to have a look at what the experimenters did but we one of the things that is is very clear is that people when they can see something like they can avoid it when they can't see it they can't avoid it and I think this is a very interesting experiment as I said these frequencies are quite complex they're not just the carrier wave with the data on it. They're pulsed, 8.33 hertz, 217 hertz. This is low frequency pulsing, right? And this low frequency pulsing is our bodies work on low frequencies. This 8.33 hertz, that's in the brain frequency range. And when they do EEG studies, they see a lot more effect, changes in brainwave patterns when people are exposed in rooms, then no effect. Um, not all studies use EEG studies, so um, the, the table above is not so clear. But when they look at the brainwave patterns, they see those changes. 217 hertz is the frame break. That, that means every pulse has a rising time and a falling time. That, so uh, these pulses, are in the same language that our brains and bodies understand. Uh, and uh, so they're interfer interfering with biology. Uh, Yuri, Yuri um, had many publications on children. In fact, uh, we started to um, uh, do a translation of one of his books. And uh, he said, no, no, I want you to do this first. I think he realised he, he, he wasn't long for this earth and uh, wanted us to focus on the uh, 5G millimetre wave frequencies. But bio biologically, children are not small adults. Um, he, as I said, he, he's written many books. Uh, we, we haven't seen them. They're in the Russian literature. The other thing, as a result of his worry about children being exposed, he has recommendations for parents on the safe use of mobile phones. Uh, and um, he, uh, this, is, uh, he, p this is part of uh, education, educational officials are made aware of this, uh, uh, this recommendation. And if they don't do that, if educational officials don't make 
uh, their students aware and the parents aware that this radiation uh, is, is a danger. Uh, it's actually uh, a criminal offence not to declare that, um, which, is, which I thought was very interesting. We now have the situation, if you look at 18 to 24 year olds, we now have the situation where um, over 50% now are using these devices for one to three hours a day, right? This, this is marketing material. This is sorry, coming. Sorry, but can yep. I just ask, are these mobile phones or are these wireless devices? Wireless devices. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so mobile phones and wireless devices. Yeah, so this is a marketing company in, in Europe. Uh, that have collated these statistics. So um, this is very concerning. And children's brains are more vulnerable. Uh, they, their skulls are thinner. So you can see here, there's much more deep penetration into the brain if they're using a mobile phone up to their head. Um, and um, this, this research was done back in 1996. This is not new. This is not new research. Uh, and uh, the mobile phones uh, that were, um, the, the, it was, uh, 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 um, the, the standard is limitation on as the base of heating in the, in the brain. So it's, it's on the basis of what, what they, uh, of, of heating. And that head, the head, the, the, the model that they use is, is a, a, a large military head of an adult person. Uh, so uh, these mobile phones were never really meant to be used by children. Um, currently admissible under under the current ICNERP or PANSA guidelines, no consumer advice on this, absolutely none. And uh, we've all seen that one down in D there. Uh, we've all seen, uh, been at the shop and, uh, and the child has been uh, in the pram uh, making a lot of noise and mum gives uh, gives 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 a child a mobile phone to pacify it. Um, it's not a good idea to put perch perch these devices near near your stomach. Rem remember, um, the, the uh, intestines is a very radiosensitive or organ, and we also produce a lot of chemicals in our gut, uh, neurotransmitters, etc. It's it's not a good idea to have these devices uh, perched on your stomach while you're watching the TV. But all this is admissible because it, it, the ICNERP or um, a PANSA standard is based on heating only as being a health effect. Where in, in our, with our ionising rate, that is X-rays and gamma rays, uh, we have a, a different organisation. It's not ICNERP, it's the International Commission on Radiological Protection. They've been around since 1928. Their, um, their standards were formed mainly by doctors, uh, radiologists and radiographers. They're very careful in their approach. They use a precautionary approach a lot, as low as reasonably achievable. They have a different philosophical approach uh, to uh, ICNERP, with these wireless guidelines where they need evidence of, ha evidence of harm before they will act. ICRP, have a different approach. They've been around a long time, more cautious, precautionary approach, optimization and justification principle applies. Now, where are we going with this technology? The, as I said, brave new world. We've now got what's termed the internet of bodies. You've all heard of the internet of things. Now we're gonna have the internet of bodies. We're gonna have microchip chips implanted into your hand so you can wave your hand and open your car door. Uh, or wave your hand next to the uh, next to the um, next to the door of security, so you be able to enter in. The, these these uh, the, we've also got Wi-Fi in nappies. Would you believe um, they, they, they're commercially available? You can buy them. Uh, we've got uh, temperature sensing pacifiers you put on ch children. I mean, this this is just the the blurring of the lines between the medical application. That is the cochlear implants, which we all know is a benefit. Uh, they benefit to people, uh, and the uh, the therapy uh, associated with exposure. Uh, we've now blurred the lines between consumer and um, and um, consumer and medical applications. There's a real problem here. There's no justification uh, required for like uh, Wi-Fi nappies because basically. 
the, um, the standard is set on the basis of heating, the level is, is in the stratosphere. You know, there's no uh, recognition that non-thermal effects uh, will have a, a health outcome long term. So basically, this is technology that's never been proven safe. And not yeah. only is it in our environment now, but it's in our bodies as well, you're saying. Well, yeah, not well. Uh, I saw uh, uh, on TV about implants. Uh, they were talking to a tattooist who, who was quite happy to uh, put uh, implants into your hand. I mean, uh, biological implant, RF implants. I mean, where does this stop? I mean, it just gets to a point of being um, absolutely uh, ridiculous, you know. So, what's our conclusions? The adoption of the ICNERP guidelines, which are the APANZA guidelines based on thermal effects, means that we have an unregulated industry basically for consumer goods, uh, pr protects the telecom industry and the government income, but bad for public health. Uh, the, the, um, by comparison, the nuclear industry is well regulated, absolutely well regulated. This industry is not. It's regulated for heat only thermal effects only. So the, the there's no recognition that all these bio effects will lead to long-term health effects. ICNERP invites Radiation Protection Society uh, scientists who only believe that this, this organization, ICNERP, is a, is a German uh, uh, cartel in, in, uh, and operates out of the Nuclear Regulatory Board in Germany it, I could never become a member of ICNERB because I, ha I hold alternative views and uh, people like Yuri would never be a member of ICNERB uh, because they held alternative views on the effect of this non-thermal, these low, low effects, 24-7 exposure uh, has a real health implications and that we should take a more precautionary approach. No consumer advice on the safe use of wireless devices, but no medical input. We, we don't have an establishment like um, Yuri uh, had, the Benazian establishment in Russia. We don't have an establishment like that where, uh, where there, are, there are clinicians working alongside physicists and engineers and, setting and getting around a round table and having all these different views. Uh, at the moment, we've only got the one view which is the thermal scientists, the ICNERP group. And as I said, there's, um, it's a very polarized, it's a very, it's a closed club. It's a cartel. Um, people with electro hypersensitivity are growing. We're finding more and more people are contacting our associate, and I'm sure they're contacting Lynn, mm -hmm. that they're not feeling well around this technology and they need to do something about limiting it. We, we've, we've now put, yeah, sorry, Lynn. Oh, sorry, we have a lot of people and uh, have for the last 25 years of doing this work. And just to explain that electromagnetic hypersensitivity is people who react with symptoms mm. as opposed to distinctly diseases. So people, as you said before, who get headaches when they're near Wi-Fi or who have memory and concentration problems when they're exposed or being near a mobile phone tower might cause rashes to come out in their body. Uh, yeah depression, irritability, there are a whole range of uncomfortable, unpleasant symptoms that are associated by people with exposure and it have been associated with ex this exposure now for, for many decades. So it's not just a couple of people here and there who have these reports, but we're talking about an increasing number in society. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and um, that lady in uh, um, northern New South Wales uh, who was exposed to chemicals while working at uh, Queensland University. Um, she um, she started to collate uh, the. Uh, uh, she produced a website and she got people to uh, enter on that website whether they were uh, whether they'd been exposed to chemicals and uh, you know they uh, and uh, she she found a lot of people who who had being exposed to other chemicals also became electro hypersensitive That's right. um, and uh, she she and another doctor um, put together that website i can't quite remember it at the moment but um yeah it's, yeah so there are a growing number of people mm. at the moment our government says uh they're they're all suffering from the nocebo effect that is they all these people uh, 
these negative outcomes are due to the fact that they believe they they're, they're going to have a negative outcome. Uh, it's 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 um, we're not researching this proper, proper properly, and uh, it it again uh, it might suit the industry to say that all these people are psychotic, but um, but that's not the case. You know, there's a lot of uh, people who um, I, I'm I, myself. I'm allergic to mangoes. <laughs> it took me a number of years to work out what I was allergic to. Uh, it's not something you. It, suddenly um you know you're exposed then you're not exposed and you know it's uh, it's a slow process mm. the other problem we have too is over reliance on calculated reports um when they put up a tower they do what is called a calculation uh an eme report a maximum maximum number there's actually no measurements or very few limited measurements being carried out and, um, and this is, uh, and, the, and I mentioned this at the ARPS conference to, um, uh, to uh, Panzer. I said, look, you know, we need to do a lot more um, background measurements. We, we, we want to know how, much, how the background's changing and how it's increasing. They said, oh, it's only a small fraction of the, of the uh, ICNERP limit. Um, it, it's not a problem. You know, we, we're wasting our time. And I'm going, well, no, not really. I, I, I gave the example of um, my experience with radon gas at Narblik. Um, but yeah, they, they basically, they've got closed minds on this. It's heating is the only effect. Um, you, you know, we don't have to do any measurements. It's way below the heating level. Uh, so we just forget that. So the question I asked at the beginning is, why is the Russian wireless communication standard for members of the public factor of 100 times lower than those countries uh, using ICNERP guidelines. And the answer is uh, long-term non-thermal effects are considered to be a plausible health risk and apply a precautionary principle in protecting citizens. So that's, um, that's really the state of play uh, on, uh, on that. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now, uh, stop sharing and we'll come back to you, Lynn. Uh, you can ask questions if you wish. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Rick. I think it's that's really important for people to understand that there are these two schools of thought and that while we in the West and we in Australia adhere to the ICNOP guidelines which say, worry about heating, forget everything else, but there is actually another school of thought that say, well, actually heating is not the be all and end all. There are other effects. And we uh, recently we talked to another physicist, Dr. Leander Riens, who is saying, well, we don't worry about heating with all toxins, with all exposures that have been shown to be dangerous. We didn't say, well, the effects of cigarettes or uh, asbestos are caused by heating effects. No, they're not. They, uh, adverse effects can be caused by things other than heating. And it, for me personally, it's a concern when our authorities are only willing to look at this much information that is the heating effects that are causing problems and willing to ignore that vast body of science that you pointed to before that says well actually all of these effects are occurring at levels that are not generating heat heating increases within the body yeah i think um what i'd like to see is um a particular concern to me is mobile phones and um the, the um the interesting thing about that was the uh, the Interphone study, which was 2000, 2004, was the last, uh, and the Cerner study around the same time, a French study. They're, they're very old studies now. They're 20 years old. Uh, back up the Interphone study, a casual user for a mobile phone was somebody who used a phone once a week. Now, that pales in significance today. We've now got the situation where people are using these devices for many, many hours a day. And anecdotally, um, people are saying, uh, uh, and there's been uh, reports in the press, that people are saying that, um, the, that the, these, um, these exposures cause my brain cancer. Mm. Now, the interesting thing is um, the, the fact that uh, IARC, the International Agency for Research and Council into cancer, uh, classified this agent to be a class 2B carcinogen, and that is a, a possible carcinogen. And they said at the time that they had limited long-term animal studies 
and and that's that's why they put it as a possible carcinogen. Now we've now had the National Toxicology Program have now concluded their thirty million dollar animal study that went over like five years, and they showed quite clearly that the types of and of course these are whole body exposures of the rats, but the types of tumours that they were seeing in the hearts of these rats and, and uh, n clear evidence that these tumours were a result of the exposure to electromagnetic radiation. These tumours, which are rare nerve tumours, uh, form from the metastasization of the nerve sheathing. These, we've now seen them in rats and we see them in human beings. They're, they're called the acoustic neur neuromas. They're, they're on the nerve of the, of the ear. We see a lot of we see that as well. So the animal evidence now is backing up uh, what we're seeing in the effects in human beings. They, they, they're parallel, you know, that's very strong evidence uh, that, that we should be at least uh, giving consumer advice to say, look, you know, don't use the phone up to your head, uh, use it um, hands-free if you can. You know, of course, there are situations where you can't get away. You know, you're on a train, a busy train, and you're wanting to have a private conversation with someone. It's important. So you do put up your head, but limit it. Limit. Don't make that your your yeah. way of doing business. Mm. You know, yeah. make that a, an alternative, always uh, an alternative. So that consumer advice is really important. And as I said, we, we've now got this situation where there's a, a smearing between the medical and consumer advice and, and uh, you know, Wi-Fi and nappies. I mean, how stupid is that? I, I can think of an application uh, of um, uh, Wi-Fi and nappies, but it, it's probably me when I get into the nursing home, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we like it, it. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, but to, uh, you know, to put it on baby girls, you know, all the all the eggs are on board. I mean, you know, what sort of in, it, that's almost insanity to do something like that. Yeah, and, I, and you know, yeah, I don't know if you remember, we used to have X-ray machines where you'd stand on the mm -hmm. X-ray machine and see if the shoe fitted inside your in, if your foot fitted inside the shoe nicely. That's right. And of course, you're irradiating the gonads, and that's so right. uh, we ban those. But where's, where's, the, where's the authorities coming out and, consume, and banning these, these um, impl in, implants into, into people's hands? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's... Well, I think that the reality is that they're not, that we can see from what you're saying, the scientific evidence is clearly showing risk. So clearly showing risk. People are clearly showing effects. They're, they're ringing us up. They're experiencing problems. They're reporting problems, mm. similar problems year after year after year after year. And in fact, we get more people reporting problems now because the exposure is greater. As you said, people are being exposed for hour after hour after hour mm. each day. So the problem is, the problem is getting bigger. The evidence is getting greater. What can we do if our authorities are not? putting protection in place for us, then it's up to us to do it for ourselves. And I think that we, as individuals, we do have uh, some opportunities to reduce our exposure. And by being sensible and doing the things that you said before, not holding your mobile phone up against your brain is a really good thing to do. And you could even do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I've got one. I've got one as well. No, I'm that's very, right. Um, yeah. yeah, so there, there are other ways of, of being able to interact with technology, with the internet, to communicate with people without yeah. having to use wireless technology. And I say to people all the time, and people are a bit stunned. There's a stunned silence when I say this to people. I say, I'm on the internet and the phone all day, every day. I have nothing wireless in my office. Mm. So just a moment for people to, to take that on board. Yes, mm -hmm. you do not need wireless to have internet or, or phone. So yeah. the, if, if people are serious about protecting themselves and reducing their exposure, there are ways of doing it. And I'd just like to encourage them, perhaps from looking at your talk today, to, to think about that and think about what they can do, what sort of lifestyle decisions that they're prepared to make. Uh, if they have children, what kind of decisions are they likely to make for their children? Will they buy 
nappies that irradiate their kids or where they prefer as a precautionary approach to not do that. You know, we, we all have so many decisions that we can make that can improve or not the quality of our lives. So it's a question of having that in consciousness and thinking about it when you, you make your purchases. Yeah, I was just going to say um, with that mobile phones, uh, the, um, uh, the Italian courts mm. actually, um, uh, there's been two successful court cases now for brain tumours in yes. Italy, in Turin. And uh, it, they, of course, the first decision the court looked at all the evidence and said, yes, yes, we're going to award compensation to these people. And then the, the telecommunications companies objected to that and appealed, but they ended up winning the appeal. And then it went to a higher court again, and they won the appeal. So uh, these are uh, lawyers and judges. And one of the things they did say is that they could see there was a real problem with this ICNERP group, mm -hmm. uh, that it was a, a closed club of thermal scientists and and that mm -hmm. um, they, they they did say that in their in their findings. Um, so again, again, uh, you know, when rational people look at the evidence, they say, "Hang on, wait a minute. Yeah, this isn't. Uh, this is not um, activists. This is a little bit more than that." And uh, people like Yuri, uh, who um, was very uh, very vocal in the early days, um, mm -hmm. back in the 1990s, and the World Health Organization, you they, you keep hearing all oh, the the, uh, the World Health Organization has a standard. Yes, because they, the people in ICNERB, uh, who the, the, um, the group in ICNERB went across to the World Health Organization and set up a uh, EMF project group and they adopted the thermal standard. They didn't, they didn't uh, take any precautions uh, in, uh, in that. So uh, you hear all the time, oh, but the WHO, the APANSA standard and the WHO and the ICNERB, yeah, yeah, but the WHO, that's the EMF group. There's another group in the, in, in, the, um, in the WHO called the International Agency for Research in a Cancer, cancer and they haven't come to that conclusion. Yeah. So you've got to be very careful. You know, there's a lot of uh, spin that's uh, been put out there and misinformation. That's right. And uh, yeah. it's it's a real problem, and uh, because I people want to believe um, their government agencies are doing the right thing, and the right thing to do is to take a precautionary approach. When Yuri when Yuri showed the WHO his experimental work, they said, "Oh, there's a problem with that experimental work. This is in the 1990s, right?" They said, "Oh, a problem with that experimental work. We." Um, uh, we don't think you use the right protocols. He said, well, okay, you tell me the protocols that I've got to use and I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat this experimental work mm -hmm. again uh, using your protocols. And guess what? He found the same bio-effects. Yeah. And so he, that was reported back to WHO. They funded that research. Guess what they did with it? The EMF group did with that research. Have a guess. I'm going to suggest they buried it. <laughs> they, yeah, ignored it, completely ignored it. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, and the other thing that really annoys me is that if you lower your standard, right, say 100 times or 1,000 times lower, what you do is change behaviour. You change the way the manufacturers produce things. Mm. They, can, they can make this technology at a much, much lower power. Oh. Uh, you know, and they're not doing that. Yeah, because hmm. it's just like speed speed uh, uh, speed limits. Hmm. Uh, you change behaviour. Hmm. So if you want to change, if you want to get mobile phone companies and wireless companies to make safer devices, lower the limit a thousand times and watch them. Hmm. They'll innovate. This hmm. technology is not going away. Hmm. They'll innovate and they'll make things to work at lower power. That's they can right. do that, That's right. but they don't want. Yeah. So the, the takeaway message is if you see the message, it complies with the standard, don't think, mm -hmm. oh, good, that's safe. Complying with the standard does not equate safety. So I hope that the people watching that today will, will have that as a takeaway message. And the other takeaway message is the evidence is there that it's risky, the evidence of scientific studies, the evidence from people who have been affected and reporting effects for decades. The evidence of risk is there. It's up to you what you do with it. You can choose how you want to be exposed, whether you want to limit your exposure and take precautions, whether you just want to go along with the, the ignorant standards and 
be exposed to lots of radiation. The choice is yours. And I think that for all of us, that's a decision that we'll, we need to constantly grapple with uh, <laughs> each yeah. time we consider buying a new technology. So I, I'm sure that this information will be really important to people as they are confronted by choices about 5G technology in the future and it will help them to make decisions about their exposure. So Vic, I'd like to thank you very, very much for your time today and hope we yeah. can talk again soon. Yeah, great. I'd just like to say um, uh, thanks, Lynn, for inviting me along. Um, we, uh, you know, if you, if you feel like you want to support us at AWSA, uh, by all means, you've come, you can become an associate member. Uh, uh, Lynn is a full member, of course, <laughs> and um, we, 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 we need that support. It's really important uh, to be able to do this work. The, the translation of Yuri's book actually cost us around $30,000. Yeah, we'll put the link to AUSA on the, the bottom of our, our blog so that people will be able to access it there. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Have a great day, Vic. No worries. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.